Welcome everybody to the Real Deals Podcast, one of the top real estate investing podcasts on iTunes for the last seven years. This is the place to be for investing strategies you can actually use, expert interviews, and of course, some good old fashioned entertainment. Now, here's your new hosts, Elliot Smith and Cole Rudd Johnson. What's going on, guys? Elliot and Cole here. Um, you know, starting out the week. Cole, what's going on with you right now, my man? Uh, not, not much, man. I mean, we're just, just cranking away like like every week on our, uh, on our wholesale flip side and then uh, just enjoying the, the beautiful weather down here in San Diego, man. It's, uh, it's hard to beat. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I was down there last week. Uh, we went down to Tijuana, setting up, looking at doing some call center stuff down there. Uh, yeah, we went and rode some jet skis with some buddies that are in the DFA that we know. I mean, that's the cool thing about being in the DFA is, you you know, everywhere I seem to go, I know somebody in that market that I can go hang out with. Um, you get free lunch. Yeah. Free, oh, I paid, for, <laughs> I paid for lunch. I was talking about me, free lunch. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, what's going on uh, your side of the business right now? Uh, you've been closing, locking up any deals. How's October been? It's almost over. Yeah, we had a we had a pretty a pretty good October. We closed on a deal today, a wholesale solid deal. We closed on a flip last week, um, and a few other wholesales earlier in the month. So everything you know, we're rolling. Um, we haven't seen you know a ton of change still with with COVID. I mean, people are selling their homes as long as you're marketing. So I think yeah, I mean, as long as we're we keep spending money, we seem to keep doing deals. Yeah. Now you upped your, 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 so you, we all, everybody, I think that knows we were doing that call center, but it was your call center before we started selling it. You went, talk about a little bit about what you did with the call center last week and or a couple weeks ago and uh, what kind of results you're seeing. And, and obviously, uh, you know, what you're doing is a lot different than a lot of people, but you know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we have always done really, really well cold call leads. So we are hiring for our sales team right now. So, um, I got a text two weeks ago from Mike, who runs, you know, the office and the sales team. And he said, we're going to need more leads if we're going to keep bringing on guys. So I'm like, say no more. And uh, so I, I messaged the call center manager. I'm like, we got to double our stuff. So we, we went to 10, 10, 10 full time agents on our campaign and we're cranking out like 35 ish leads a day right now just from cold calling. That's so, crazy. Um, yeah, man. We're, I mean, we're all in on we're all in on it right now. It's it's been working for us for the past few years, and nothing's changed. So, we're are you not running out of data? No, I mean, we just keep we uh, we pretty much market to all of Washington, like for the counties that we want to do business in. So, um, we have never. I mean, this is going on my fourth year now of cold calling. You know, anywhere from five to fifteen agents at a time, and no, we've never run out of people to call. Nice. Now, how? Like, tell us, tell me a little bit, because I still am interested sometimes. I don't always understand how, like, how often are you calling those people? So, like, say you pull a list for, like, King County or Pierce yeah. County, right? And yeah. you run through that. Our dialer tells you there's no, there's no more juice in this list. What are you doing then? Uh, I mean, a couple of things you can do, like, like, a lot of times we will, like, we're not going to call that same list right away. But, you know, if you're in a bigger metropolitan area, you can go to those, you know, less motivated seller seller lists, like you know, owner occupied list, um, with just not a lot of filters on it, and you're still going to get deals from that. Yeah. Um, so I think the key is we, we just market to everyone because I mean, someone might not show up on an absentee or a probate or a foreclosure list, you know, but they're still going to be a motivated seller because of, of a random reason. We did a deal three months ago. We made forty grand on. It was just a guy. He wasn't on any list. He was just an owner occupied. He he had a lot of equity in the house, and he's like, he shows up to work one day early on in the whole COVID fiasco. And he was like, uh, I want out, I want to leave. I want to be gone Friday. I want to be in a different state. I want to be in Minnesota. So we, we just close on it in five days and six days. And, um, so there's deals everywhere. So I just think the key is exactly that to, to market as much as we do is don't get caught up on a certain list. Just kind of cast the widest net as you can. Yeah, no, totally. Yeah. Cause I know we, you know, the call center, we're having people, you know, there's just in one smaller market, you know, you can only, there's only so many people, even if you dialed every friggin' property in there, you're always going to run into some issues. Um, but uh, yeah, so what's going on with us? We're moving forward with the eight unit. Um, commercial underwriting is a lot different. Um, luckily, I got my wife that she handles, you know, all that stuff. I've been seeing all the emails and luckily she kind of takes that off my plate. And you guys almost kind of lost, you guys almost lost that deal, right? Temporarily. Yeah, we almost lost it. The seller came back and like there's two sellers and the one guy we agreed we asked for a price reduction because like the PL wasn't um 
you know, for our loan, we needed a price reduction because we didn't want to bring like 35% down. So <clears throat> we needed a price reduction from a million 60 to, we tried to get a million 10, um, but then they came back at a million 33. We kind of said, take, you know, we kind of played like hardball, but then I ended up caving at a million 33. Well, then the guy went out of town and then he got sick. He got COVID and came back two late, weeks later and he had a totally different idea. And he's like, nope, I don't want to sell except for the 1 million 60. So uh, we told him, you know, go pound sand. <laughs> and so um, they ended up signing at the million 33, but he just kind of had this stupid idea that he wanted more money. So he said, go sell it to somebody else. I mean, no big deal. Um, but yeah, that then locked up a nice little $27,000 wholesale deal this week. Um, from one with my, one of my buddies, I was in the market, we worked it together. And so, uh, that worked out really well. Uh, that one was a one that they followed up on quite a bit. So that shows, you know, the follow up does, does matter. Then we got, we've been going on some good seller appointments. We got one a day. Um, I feel like it's picking up a little bit. We'll see what, you know, next week brings on well, lead I think, flow. I think it'll be more telling after the election on, uh, what the next year is going to look like. In terms yeah. Of yeah. So. We got direct mail slammed, ready to go. We're, we, we're dropping a ton of direct mail. We're dropping like our whole list next week. So after the election, so um, be interesting to see if that works or not. That's kind of my my strategy one way or another. Half the country is going to be pissed and half the country is going to be happy. So just hope- uh, Hopefully you know, Tri-Cities is happy. <laughs> yeah, hopefully one side or the other is uh, not going to burn it down or whatever, burn stuff down. So um, other than that, man, Friggin' Ken McElroy today. Crazy episode today. That dude is a uh, he's a genius. I've been from the I mean I get I would call him a genius, yeah. Yeah, I would call I'll call him a genius, but at the end of the day he's a normal guy, you know. I mean it's and so but like it's funny because we really dive into a wide range of topics, but we it's really focused around like, you know, kind of coal in, in the sense of, you know, you don't have to be twenty two, but you're somebody early on in the business, you're in there three, four years. I mean, you're not that much earlier than me or uh, longer after me, but, um, you know, what are you doing? What are you doing long-term? How are you, you know, how are you avoiding taxes? How are you looking for long-term? Like what would Ken do if he was in our shoes again? And so, yeah. yeah I mean, I, I think you brought up a, a crazy example of the, the though here on the podcast today too, with the, the billboard thing. He's yeah. talking about where, uh, just how many opportunities are out there, no matter who's, you know, who gets elected for president, no matter what's going on with COVID, there's so many opportunities out there. We talk a lot about being creative yeah. um, and how that's allowed him to, uh, you know, dip his hands in so many different uh, parts of real estate. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a great list. And I, I learned it. I learned a ton. Yeah. Being a part of it. I you know. know. I, he, uh, I mean, you, we're talking to a guy that has a billion dollars, over a billion dollars worth of real estate. I mean, he talks yeah. about how he almost sold for a couple, couple billion or whatever dollars to his portfolio to Blackstone. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if anybody doesn't know, Blackstone's the biggest friggin' hedge fund there is in the in the world. Um, yeah. Asset, you know, most I think they have the most assets under management, and they're huge in real estate space. So you know, we go from that to like you said, billboards. Um, talking about his kids, how he got his kids to you know kind of be entrepreneurs and not spoil them. Um, you know, he talked about how there's opportunities um, for incentives, no matter who the president is. You know, some years it was gas and oil tax or incentive uh, tax breaks. Then it was solar. I mean, if you guys remember a couple of years ago, there was solar tax breaks. Everybody wanted solar. So you get all these tax breaks or Tesla tax breaks, right? All these incentives or whatever. And so these guys would put a bunch of money in whatever tax break. So even if Biden, what I took out of that is even if Biden gets elected and they want to do their, you know, their hundred trillion dollar green new deal thing, there's going to be tax incentives to do things. So how do I put my money in those? Yeah. And I mean, I think, uh, kind of wrapping it up here. I think I always know it's going to be a good episode when I'm sitting there and I'm you know, I forget I'm even like talking or like a part of the interview just because there's so much good information coming at me from who we're interviewing. So today was definitely one of those where I kind of found myself yeah. just learning yeah. so much that it was hard to, uh, hard not to just want to just sit there the whole time and listen to what he's saying because there's so much actionable information that's coming from me. Yeah, totally. And and I think we were both talking before, like I remember five or six years ago when we were first, when I first reading all these books, you know, we read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, then we read, read the other books and some of the books were his and I remember listening to these audio books as I'm driving my friend's truck up and I can remember the exact spot I'm listening to this book you know I'm driving up in the hills back at Camas going back to this little dinky town stop and I'm listening to Ken McElroy on the books you know one two three ABC's of real estate investing or whatever and I'm and I'm sitting here and I'm interviewing this guy you know 
I'm but you know, I've talked to this guy a couple of times, you know, we've hung out, we, you know, I'm not best friends with him by any means, but it's like, and he looks at us like we're equals. And that's the cool thing about this is, you know, he really, resp- you know, he would give us more time than, you know, we probably, you know, should have asked from him. And he talked to us like we we're adults. He didn't have an ego. He didn't come talk to us like we were little kids. I mean, he just talked to us like normal. And it was just, it was pretty cool. I don't know if you felt like that was pretty cool, but I, I really did. Yeah, no, I, I definitely, I thought it was a, it was an awesome experience, an awesome interview. I think people are gonna enjoy the whole thing and it's, it's worth a few listens. Yeah, totally. All right, guys. Well, uh, we'll catch you on the next week. Enjoy the show. It's uh, about an hour and 10 minutes. Um, but man, it's worth every single second that you spend on this show. Uh, again, um, I think you're going to really love it. So, all right, guys, catch Thanks you next week. All right, Real Deals Podcast listeners, I want to talk quickly about our show's sponsor, Iron Bridge Lending. If you guys have not reached out to Iron Bridge already to talk to them about funding some of your upcoming flip projects, I highly encourage you to do so. I've known the owner of Iron Bridge for a very long time. I personally borrowed millions of dollars from them over the years to do a number of different projects, and I can say without a doubt, they are the best hard money lending company I have ever come across, and that is the reason why they are the sole sponsor of this show. I've had a lot of other companies reach out to me and want to sponsor this show, but I just won't do it. I feel like I need to be genuine in who we have sponsoring the show, and it needs to be somebody that I've personally done a ton of business with. So I personally vouch for their ability to be the best, hands down, in the world of hard money lending. You won't find better programs, you won't find better terms, and they're lending or will be lending in over 20 states. So chances are, if you're hearing this in whatever state you're in, it's definitely worth it to check out their website, reach out to them, see if they're lending in your state, and if they are, I would absolutely encourage you to do business with them. Another very cool thing to note is that they have a program for most rehabs where you can actually borrow up to 90% of the purchase price. Now, this is given the fact that you are actually buying a deal, which if you're listening to the show, that means you probably are. But if you have an actual deal on the table, they'll fund up to 90% of your purchase price and they'll even give you rehab funds on top of that, which means that it only takes 10% down to get into a project, which is unbelievable in the hard money world. So, Do yourself a favor, reach out to Ironbridge Lending, have a conversation with them, see if they're a good fit for you and for your next project. I can guarantee you that you'll be happy that you did. All right, guys. Welcome, welcome to Real Deals Podcast. Uh, Cole Elliott here. We got a special guest, the godfather, the legend, the man himself, Ken McElroy. Uh, Ken, what's going on? Hey, guys. What's happening? Good to be on your show, man. Congrats. Thanks. Yeah, we're pretty pumped. Yeah, yeah, you should be. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's nice. I, I mean, what's really nice is that you guys kind of went through the battle on your own, privately, independently, reading books, going to stuff, you know, go learn on YouTube and all the other platforms, and now you're out doing it yourself. So uh, there's a lot of people in your um, uh, in your arena and your age that would love to know the secrets of how you two pulled it off. So uh, congrats. Yeah, a lot of hard work and dedication. Um, I think that would be, you know, actually getting after it and having hard work and, and doing those things. So, um, and it's just cool that Tucker trusted us to take over his podcast. It's got multiple millions downloads. So we're getting good exposure right from the get go. You don't have to start bootstrapping it. So um, anyway, why don't you get in um, real quick, Ken, and just tell people if they don't know who you are, tell them about your story, some of the books you wrote, kind of who you are in a, in a nutshell. Sure, sure. Um, so uh, right out of university, I went to school. I grew up in Seattle, uh, started managing property, actually, to pay rent, you know, because you get a free apartment, you know, yeah, yeah. and uh, that's important when you're running up school loans. And uh, I certainly was doing that. My parents uh, never went to college. And, and uh, you know, so we grew up uh, very, you know, I would say, uh, uh, you know, below middle class and, and um, you know, there, there wasn't a big expectation for anyone in our family, certainly, to move on to college. But um, uh, luckily, I got into college through a wrestling scholarship, of all things. And then I started managing property. And I ended up um, managing a property downtown Seattle. And it's not that I felt like it wouldn't have been that hard, you know, collect some rent, fix some stuff. Yeah. But it was really hard, man, <laughs> I, you know. And uh, luckily, I had a construction background. My dad was a contractor. And, and so I knew how to fix stuff. And I'm like, well, how hard can it be to collect rent? Well, I didn't know anything. But I, you know, the free rent was a motivator. And, and so I, um, that was kind of my first stint at, you know, the real estate and property management and all that. And then what happened one day is the owner came in, uh, gosh, must have been 
three, four months later, he's like, Hey, nice job, man. You filled this place up and you cleaned it up. It looks better. And I'm making more money. And he pulled up in his Mercedes. I'll never forget. And uh, I'm like, dude, like I am on the wrong side of the desk yeah. here, you know, and uh, you know, luckily I was just getting out of university. I was young and, and um, not really sure what I was going to do. I had a business degree that I was finishing up and and so that's when I started getting my real estate license. And then I, I really, I dug into property management. So I got, I got, uh, I had a good 10 year run just managing properties in the, mostly in the uh, Seattle area and, and Las Vegas and, and California and Portland and all that. And uh, through a big company that's based out of there. And, and then I just started my own firm from there and I started buying properties. And first one was a two bedroom, two bath, used all my own cash. Second one, same. And then you kind of run out of money and you have to learn yeah. how to raise it. So, you know, so, so, you know, you just kind of, I learned really slowly over time. And uh, since then I've had a lot of different businesses and uh, my current company, uh, uh, 15 years now, uh, we have uh, right around a, a billion dollars worth of multifamily. And so we're mostly multifamily guys. We do have self storage. We develop those and we do have office and we do land development too. We got about 250 people and, um, you, you know, a couple thousand investors that invest in our, in our question, stuff. That's a question I've always had for these guys in these large funds. Um, so, you know, you, you see these syndicators, right? They're like, I have 4,000 units, but they only own a certain small percentage, but you have a 250 employees. So you got to be having a lot of uh, money coming in off those. So you, you own a, a good significant stake of those properties. Um, and, and then also you're getting, uh, paid for the management and all the other things that go into it? Yeah, it's a good question. So I'm the general partner on all of them. Okay. And, um, and then I invested, uh, you know, so in, in deals, you have a, a GP and an LP. So the GP is, you know, the sweat equity or the carried interest or whatever you want to call it. And then the LP is where the money comes in. And so I'm on both sides. And okay. uh, the way our deals are structured is the investor's um, when they get their money back, then the GP interest kicks in. So I own the majority of everything that okay. we have. And uh, my partner and I, Ross McAllister, uh, own, own it together. We own MC companies together. We have a, uh, a property management company called MC Residential. We, we have a construction company uh, that we do our own ground up construction and we're, we're a developer. And then we have a number of other companies uh, that support the management company, like a utility company, a collection company, gotcha. screening, screening company, and things like that, that all kind of support the operations. And so all of that was developed and, and organized around that one piece, but it all revolves around finding the right deal and, and raising the capital in the beginning. And then everything else, we manage ourselves. I know you said you're from Seattle. When you, when you guys started buying, were you buying way in Washington or where was the first location you guys started to buy 15 years o ago? Oddly enough, I learned in Seattle, but I ended up actually buying in Arizona when because uh, I had moved there already for uh, a big company. It's, it was, it's called Pinnacle now. Uh, okay. Back then it was called Goodman, John Goodman. Uh, and, um, and so, uh, you know, John had expanded into Phoenix and to Las Vegas and, uh, Seattle. And, and I ended up, um, uh, moving to, uh, Las Vegas and then to Phoenix to manage some of those offices for him. And, and so my first deals were in, uh, Arizona. Cool. Now I see a lot about REITs. Um, have you ever thought about turning your, your company into a REIT or taking it public or? Oh yeah. A ton of times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, we explore that all the time. So there's, there's real pros and cons of REITs. Um, you, you know, it's a great way to, to raise capital okay. and, um, and nothing wrong with a REIT that, you know, it's, it's complicated. It's, uh, uh, you know, you're, you're driven by what's called FFO, which is funds from operations. So you're very heavily, you know, cause that's the, ultimately the return that, that you, you pay out. But, um, we've elected at this point to stay private and, and just do the one-off deals. So it's very common for us to raise, you know, 15 to 20 million in equity for a deal. Okay. And, and uh, we just keep it on an independent uh, SPE or, or single purpose entity and, and just buy one deal, fund it, move to the next one. Cool. I know with COVID, you know, everyone's question is going to be, what, what was your buying like pre-COVID versus now? Are you guys still buying at the same clip or 
what does that look like right now? Yeah, so we actually pulled back and uh, we're just kind of waiting to see what's happening on, you know, everything. So it's interesting. We, it, it, everyone's got a different spin on it. You, you know, the brokers are, uh, the, the sellers, they're looking for pre-COVID pricing. <laughs> or after co or COVID yeah. pricing in the residential market. They think it's freaking 10 times better because interest rates. Yeah. Right, right. So it's very interesting. The sellers have not figured out yet that, you know, there's uncertainty in the air. Uh, and right now there doesn't seem to be, but the whole thing, as you guys know, is basically propped up by the Fed. So I think uh, at the moment, it's just a weird time. So we're waiting to see, you know, kind of where people migrate and, and, you know, we're in no hurry to do deals. That's the beauty of owning deals and having cash flow. And, you know, so that was one of the first things I learned as a young man is the difference between cash flow and capital gains, you know? So we have hundreds of thousands of dollars coming in every single month, just from, um, just from the management company, for example, yeah. and millions more on the investments every single month. And so we don't have to actually do a deal to keep our doors open. We don't have to, you know, we're not transaction based, we're, you know, timing based. So, um, and so, uh, we did actually have a, a, a deal that we were bidding on it, uh, this week. And, uh, and so we're still active, but not as active. And we have a full-time acquisition guy. And, right. you know, we're, we're actually uh, really focused more on land. So we have five land deals uh, all around 50 million uh, in development uh, each. So a couple hundred, th a couple hundred million worth of, um, of ground up construction in the pipeline. Gotcha. So, okay, let me ask you this because, um, especially with the ground up, because I was actually switching our company to a development company this year. Um, I was going to start going after land. I had a goal. I wanted to have 80 lots under um, because I really wanted to go do land. And instead of selling the lots off, I wanted to retain lots, have the builders build me properties, then refi them out, take my profits out that way, and then keep, you know, refi them out, live on the refi, and have properties at 50% LTV. Well, land has gotten really scarce. But because and you're starting to see a lot of uh, urban flight right now. I know you've talked a lot about this um, in some of your podcasts and your episodes. So you're seeing, um, you know, some of these REITs that are that are holding things in the urban core areas are down 45 percent year over year on stock. You're seeing rents drop 20, 30 percent in L.A. You're seeing rents plummet in condo market in, in San Francisco. Um, how can you fully underwrite deals right now? knowing that there is so much uncertainty um, with one, what's the economy going to look like uh, Two, are people actually going to move here? You know, is this going to be the right property, the right place? How do you underwrite that kind of stuff on bigger deals or any deal in, in that matter that takes such a long time? It's very confusing guys. I'm not going to, I'm not going to BS you. You know, we we're you know, on the deal that we, um, you know, we we're bidding on right now, we got a, a term sheet from the lender and they had a massive line item in it called COVID reserve. <laughs> it's actually a line item now. So it was a couple million bucks of, you know, what they called COVID reserve. We're like, what the heck is this? Yeah. They're like, Hey, you know, it's the uncertainty piece around it all. You got to be very careful. Um, I think at the end of the day, you got to kind of sift through it all and then decide whether or not this market is going to be good from an employment standpoint, because ultimately that's my demographic. So, you know, we're in the rental business. And, and so, you know, do, are, are we providing a good value for that market? And is it oversupplied, undersupplied, or is it getting nailed right now? And we're not in any urban cores at the moment, but uh, that will be something that we might change later. Once, once things start to hit the skids, you know, those, those, uh, those places aren't coming back anytime soon, in my opinion. All right, podcast listeners, I want to take a quick break, and I want to tell you about something I'm very passionate about, and that is our Deal Finders Academy, or the DFA, as many of you have probably heard me refer to it as. Now, the DFA has been around for almost seven years, which is amazing that we've had it around that long, and we've had one hell of a track record with some of the biggest names from across this business having been a part of the DFA or are still a part of today. And some of those names, just to drop a few on you, are Justin Silverio from Open Letter Marketing, Ryan Dossey from Call Porter, 
Jason Nickel from a little company called Lead Sherpa. Anson Young from Bigger Pockets, of course, many of you know him. Uh, how about Robert Hyder and Philip Vincent, two fine gentlemen from the greater St. Louis area who need no introduction, are very well known. Uh, how about Mr. Danny O'Bannon, the original Spokane Project, a uh, guy that I pulled back out of a day job and turned him into a crazy successful real estate investor. And of course, Artem Tepler, who's building hundreds of millions of dollars worth of multifamily all over the greater Los Angeles area. And... Of course, last but not least, uh, both Cole and Elliot, who are now the hosts of this show. So as you can see, the list goes on and on. And there's so many other people that I didn't mention there that uh, I've gotten the, the good fortune of getting to know and that are a part of the community now that are just amazing people and uh, even more av amazing investors. But for you that are a listener of the show that may be thinking, hey, you know what? I might be interested in joining that group. Here's what you get, right? Well, number one is you get to be a part of this amazing community. You get the connections. You get everything that comes along with a small and very tight-knit type mastermind, a group that isn't so big that you feel like you can't converse with people, you can't have conversations, um, because that's where you kind of get lost in the weeds. You want one that is just big enough that it's got reach, and you've got these people that you can connect with that are amazing in their own right, but not so big that you just feel overwhelmed. And that is exactly what the DFA is. We have about 120, 125 people in the group, which is just the perfect size. And the reason why it stays at that size is because we don't overlap investors, right? One investor per one area. And that's why most people stay with us for a very long time, because by being a part of the group, you get access to all of our secret marketing strategies, negotiation strategies, tips, tricks, everything else you could possibly think of so that you can have those competitive advantages in your area and also be able to utilize the network that the DFA is, which as you can tell, it's an amazing network. I do business with lots of people that have been in it or are currently in it right now. And uh, plenty of other people in the group have made lifelong friendships and business partnerships within the group also. So if you're interested in joining the DFA, which I strongly encourage you to do, go to thedealfindersacademy.com, book a call, you'll chat with Dan. We'll see if we've got room in your market for for you. And uh, if we do, we'd love to make you our next DFA member. Before we got into that, I was, I was going to piggyback on my question about buying if they were selling anything um, off during this time with you guys, just like what you have seen. I remember watching one of uh, the first interviews that we did of Tarl on his um, thing talking about uh, you guys' COVID strategy. That was back in like April or May. So since then, have you guys changed that? Or are you still just holding on? What does what the rent collection look like on that side of things? Yeah, we'll go over that part. So on our current operations, we're we've been great. Uh, I mean, we really thought it was going to be a lot worse, you know, because not only you know were people losing their incomes in, largely in in a lot of uh, areas, but then in addition to that, the Trump and then the states and then now the CDC has kind of overlaid this eviction issue, you know, and said that you you know we don't really care if they don't pay you, but you know, you can't get them out anyway. So all of that was going on. And so what we did is we said, listen, there's not a lot we can do here. Let's just hunker down on some cash reserves and, you know, deal with it on a case by case basis. Uh, we have been very, very fortunate where we're collecting literally 96 to 99% every single month, depending on the property and the demographic and, you know, who, who lives in it. Obviously the the, the properties that have, let's say they're heavily geared toward, let's say tourism, as an example, have been hit a little harder, but it's a case by case basis on the individual itself. So like we have pilots, we have a ton of pilots in the Phoenix area, as an example, in one property uh, over near the airport. And, um, you know, they're still paying, you know, they're, you know, these are, uh, you, you know, obviously they have resources, but you know, it's so it's all, uh, it, but they've been propped depends. up too by the, the government. Yep. And, and now you're starting to see that they, you know, since they can't, can't get a relief package done, the air airlines are starting to lay those people off or do furloughs and things like that. Yeah. But would you say, are most of your properties in Arizona? No, or well, uh, it's, we're all over. So we have a lot in Phoenix, a lot in Tucson. Um, we're basically in every city in Texas. Okay. We have, we have stuff in Oklahoma and stuff in Nevada. And and uh, and I have one small deal in Portland that I'm actually um, exiting soon. Yeah, I don't uh, but <laughs> other, than, other than that, yeah. So other than that, uh, and and uh, I, and I do have some stuff in, in Vegas still. But 
the uh, generally, I would say our core stuff is Texas and Arizona. Now, are you when you're underwriting these deals, and I don't want to make this political by any sense, but it seems like there seem to be a really big divide between red states and blue states right now with COVID, right? With COVID strategies. I know Washington, Oregon has a lot stricter lockdown policy than let's say um, Arizona for the most part or whatever. And you're starting to see a lot more of that urban flight going to Idaho. I know Boise's on fire. Mm-hmm. Um, Scottsdale, Arizona. I know we're looking at Texas. We're looking at, I mean, I hear a lot of my friends in Seattle and Portland. They just, they're tired of the politics. They're tired of all the stuff, the homeless, all these things. Do you feel like if you're underwriting a deal right now, are you more confident going in? Again, it's not political, but are you more confident going into a red state versus a blue state right now? Yeah, of course. So, so that's actually not new for, for us. So, you know, there's a really good video on YouTube um, where the CEO of Starwood, you know, Starwood Hotels, yep. mm-hmm. um, does an hour. I think it's a super in, uh, interview. And he, he just talks basically about how and why they built the hotels where they built them. And they were all based around, if you think about it, um, high property taxes, high labor to the unions, and all the different barriers to entry for a particular city or state. And, and so, you know, and he says red or blue, you know, when we're underwriting anything, or you guys are for, for that matter, you know, the taxes the insurance, all those things are a big piece of whether or not you buy somewhere, uh, you know, and not uh, uh, on a non-political uh, comment, you know, we made the same decision when, uh, when you look at Florida or you look at the Gulf area around Texas, you know, you'll have insurance rates that are three times what they are in Phoenix because of the hurricanes and the tornadoes and things like that. So the underwriters for insurance have have, uh, you know, you know, uh, already b- baked all that into their numbers. And so, so all of that has to be considered based on, you know, what the expenses are. And then from there, you just look at the rent, you know, yeah. what, what's the rent? Is it 1500 a month? Is it 1200 a month? Is it 2000 a month? Is it 3000 a month or whatever? And so then you, it's just math at that point. But yes, the, the answer is, you know, from a, from a, you know, from a political standpoint, what I'm more concerned about is actually rent control. Yeah. And, and um, you know, so as an example, I don't know if you guys saw what's the current stuff that's going on in Portland right now that you, oh, have, yeah. to, oh, you yeah. have to, you have to pay for relo- relocations. Yeah. Okay. So the government's saying one, you can't evict two, we're going to cap your rent and three, now you have to relocate your tenant um, so they're capping your income and they're telling you you have to relocate. So, you know, so you have to look at this and I'm not saying, by the way, that's right or wrong. I'm just saying from an investment standpoint is that you want those barriers uh, involved when you put money somewhere and we don't, you know, we would rather, okay, organs off the list. Now let's just move, you know, somewhere else like Boise as an example, where it, you know you, you, you can operate a little more free market. If somebody decides they don't want to pay, um, you know, for their car, you could take the car. But apparently, not in Oregon, you know. Yeah, but, but the, the, the problem that I'm seeing, Ken, um, is we went to Boise a couple months ago. They they have a blue mayor. I mean, they have a Democratic mayor. I mean, it seems like you're getting this urban flight that then all of a sudden they're going and taking the same policies they're leaving. And so where's safe? I mean, that's at the end of yeah. the day, you know, so uh, if you're Cole's age, right, and you're starting out young, I mean, what do you look at? I mean, what are you thinking long term? Well, you have to consider that stuff. You, you really do. You, you know, it, ironically, uh, you know, it's, you, you know, a blue mayor is going to turn a city, uh, you, you know, uh, quickly. And, and so but, um, you, you know, you have to look at the, the whole picture. But the truth is, yeah, here we're in Arizona and we have a, a you know, a, a governor that's a Republican, uh, actually a very good friend of mine. I was in EO with him. Mm-hmm. He's in my for- he was actually in my forum. Um, and, and uh, you know, we are um, we potentially have an issue where we might turn blue during this election. And and so, you know, so we have all those things coming up, too. But I think for a coal standpoint or for any young person's standpoint, you really do have to look at the policies and, you know, the government um, uh, mandates of what they're going to do in, in areas. And that has to be considered long term. 
in whatever decisions you make, especially when it comes to capping your revenue. Yep. Yeah, I mean, as a, as a young person, I talk to this about with Elliot all the time, just where I want to live long term, not just where I want to invest in um, do real estate, but what do you see as um, like if you could go back to 22 and you were just starting to build a portfolio and um, would you focus more on those, you know, those the Arizonas and the Floridas and um, areas where people are starting to move out of California, out of Washington, out of Oregon, and you can still, um, you know, not only it's, it's affordable right now, but long term, um, it's going to be a cheaper place to live. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 you know, I think naturally, and I fell into this too, Cole, it's a great question. You know, if, if um, like it happens in, in Phoenix, Arizona, so obviously the core area downtown urban is going to be more than two, three, four miles out. And so, you know, those are decisions that, ha in my opinion, have to be driven by, you know, who's your renter. And so uh, a lot of people go chase that, that cheap deal and there's nothing wrong with that, but then they, they have, and then they struggle with trying to get it full and trying to get the revenue to cover it. I just did that. I just, I bought a duplex in a, a cheap duplex in Cleveland about a year ago with a, with, yeah. a buddy, with a buddy of mine. We were like, like, all right, we got money. What, what are we going to do with it? I'm like, I met one guy and he was like, I've been buying duplexes in Cleveland for cheap. And we bought it and one sewer line thing. Thankfully we got it covered, but it would have destroyed our, our, our income for like three years in the property. So we just, we just sold it and closed on it this week. Actually, we got rid of it, but yeah. Yeah. Yes. I know firsthand. About yeah. That. So yeah. But if you buy one next to the Cleveland clinic, as an example, because of the employment base there, the Cleveland clinics, obviously world round blowing up, um, you know, and healthcare is going to be a massive thing. So, um, you, you know, you can do well in those little markets, those mid, mid markets. Uh, I, I actually think that you're going to, I actually think that with the, all this migration, you know, people are going to, um, they're going to start to look more at, because they can work remotely. So that, you know, if, if you can, if you can get out of Seattle where you're paying a million bucks and you can move to, you know, Boise and pay three or 400 grand, uh, you're going to scoop that equity and work remotely. You're going to do it. And, and we're, you're already seeing that there's some great articles that came out yet, even this week on, on migration. And they're saying it, it's, it's somewhere between 20 and 30 million people are moving around right now. And, and so I think you kind of, kind of let that dust settle a little bit and there's no urgency at the moment, in my opinion. And when it does, does settle, what kind of impact do you think this will all have on commercial real estate with, you know, people working virtual? I know, I mean, I talked to one guy, he was saying that Facebook's recruiting from other companies based on the whole, you can work virtual forever pitch. Or uh, Pinterest, yeah. or Pinterest yeah. paying $98 million yeah. to get out of their lease out of San Francisco. Yeah. So yeah. What, what do you see long-term that? So, yeah, yeah. The, 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 the office market is going to be a real problem. And, and I think that, um, you know, so I, I own some office and, and I've had a lot of conversations with office guys. And basically what's really on fire right now is the two to 4,000 square foot office spaces. So people are, you know, they're, they're at the moment, at least they're going, okay, we don't need 20. We don't need 15. We don't need 10. And so if they can, so I think, you know, these office leases, as you guys know, are three years, five years, seven years, 10 years. And so I think this is going to be a continued thing over a long period of time. And some of these big expensive buildings, you know, like uh, Elliot brought up, like in downtown um, San Francisco, which is a great example. I mean, Twitter's down there, Google's down there, Salesforce is down there, Pinterest is down there. Uh, you know, there's a lot of big businesses down there that are, are basically saying you can remote work remotely. So I think office is going to be a, um, a really, really, really in trouble um, over the long period. Um, mm -hmm. But at the same token, you know, there's there are people, you know, even my company where we have, um, you know, we're even trying to look at, OK, how do we repurpose our space? Uh, you know, you know, what, 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 what does it look like moving forward and how many people do we really need in here every day and all that kind of stuff. And uh, you know, I don't know if that's going to continue long term or not, but so I think office is a really uh, uh, problematic long term. I, I think that the, um, uh, you know, those micro hotels and, and resorts and things are in big, big trouble uh, over the long haul. 
and, and, uh, and, and depending on their configurations and things like that. So I actually own a resort and um, it, it's, uh, it's actually doing pretty well because I have their individual cabins over uh, you know a lot of acreage and so you can rent basically your own little home is that the cabin. one in arizona or are you doing that belize yeah. one with uh with uh, randy hubs no <laughs> that's the one in uh, sedona gotcha so um arizona so uh so we're doing okay but the restaurant's closed you know yeah. um and so you know we're getting killed on uh, um you know weddings events liquor you know food but we're doing really well on the occupancy side but um, so I think those are going to be a real problem, um, you know, you know, long, long term as well. And uh, what's going to do really, really well is uh, industrial, which is, by the way, it was already doing it was on fire. Well. It was on fire, on fire before. Now it's really, really on fire, you, you know, as everybody's buying, you know, from retailers and, and they need, you know, uh, big box uh, storage. So it's very interesting. And uh, obviously the regional malls are toast. Uh, well, I've, and- I've done some research and I um, actually in Idaho Falls, they had a couple like this. So the big strip malls that house the like the home ho- Home Depots or the Lowe's and they have other ones like, a, you know, a sports authority or something that went out of business. So they have huge spaces. What I've, I'm hearing, they're repurposing those um, in Idaho Falls. They did some schools in there, some like uh, um, charter schools. They're also Amazon is buying a lot of those um, or taking a lot of those buildings and putting like a last mile delivery. So they're taking their top, you know, thousand products that they're delivering a lot of and putting those little little hubs for their last mile delivery kind of service. Yep. Uh, um, I have some buddies that own a FedEx building um, for and he said this is freaking cash cow if you can buy it right because they're not going anywhere. Um, and so the other thought you made a good comment earlier, and I'd like to speak maybe a little bit more on this on the office space. But on medical, um, you know, you see a lot of these hospitals. Uh, my dad was a phys- is a physician and he owned he was like one of the first guys to do a immediate care. But now it's all going to the hospitals are owning a lot of those. So putting but then they have their doctors and their surgeons and all these people that are housing right around the hospital because there are more and more doctors services are going through the hospital. Do you think that commercial like that is a good option around hospitals like the, like you say in the Mayo Clinic, uh, Vanderbilt, you know, UW, things like that as a long term play? It could be. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not as versed around that, but I can tell you that, you know, everything that I've read and everything that I'm seeing is, you know, anything that has to do with retired baby boomers getting sicker, mm-hmm. you know, and, and needing all the services that they're going to need from medical to pharmaceutical to medical supply is all going to do very, very, very well based on where they are. So that's yeah. why I like Phoenix and Scottsdale long term. And, um, you, you know, cause it's pretty reasonable here still. And, and I'm in Scottsdale now and, and, uh, you know, I, um, I think that if you compare Scottsdale or Phoenix to Seattle or Portland, it's, it, or anywhere in California, it's, it's a deal. And mm-hmm. so that's why, that's why we're still doing well at the moment. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. It's, uh, it's going to be interesting how it shakes out. But you've been talking a lot about where you're reading, what you're reading. Um, can you dive in? Like, what do you study? I mean, I've always, you know, we started out reading your books, right? Now it's like, I read through all the real estate books. Cole's read through all the books. Now it's time to grow and study. Well, piggy, piggyback on, piggybacking on that too. When you're looking into a market, Ken, for whatever your self-storage side of your company, your development side, your multifamily side, what are you looking for in that market right now in 2020 going through a pandemic that's, you know, yeah. Great. So uh, the cool part about commercial and actually residential too, is the demographics are all different. I mean, they're different in the, in the low end housing versus high end. They're different in, in storage. They're different in office. They're different in multifamily and class A, B, C multifamily. So, so, uh, so primarily for us, you know, when we look at, do we want to build a building somewhere we basically look at the occupancy and the rent growth for that particular market, and then and and then uh, look at the barriers to entry from a supply standpoint. So, so uh, let let's say I mean, and it it can be dramatic, Cole. So, you know, one mile away or two miles away, you can have two or three thousand units of multifamily enter a market, or and you, you might have a month free, a half a month free. Well, as you get closer to something else, you might not have anything, you, you know, based on uh, on the 
you know, on how many units or supply you have in an area. So you always got to take a look at that at a sub market level, you know, how many units and, and what are the rents and what do they look like in, in a particular market space. And you, that's why I love real estate because there's always deals in, you know, to be figured out. There's, there's definitely areas that are undersupplied on a number of levels on a number of things. You know, you can always find a place to drop a storage unit because I can tell you right now, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of places all over the country that could use them. And, um, and it's always based on what people are doing and what the current, um, uh, you know, facilities are doing at that very moment. So when we looked at doing self storage and we did it in, in Corpus Christi, we built 750 units there. You know, the, the storage units there were completely full and that economy was growing at the time. And, uh, you, you know, you basically you count rooftops and, and single family rooftops as you're trying to figure out that metric. Yeah. Um, for, for the multifamily side, it's very, very different. It's more jobs based. And you're, you're trying to take a look at, okay, because you, you know, who, who, um, who can't afford a home in this area? And, and, um, and what's that price point on the rent? And where are they working? So those are all the things you look at for the multifamily side. So you're saying being more of a like diving into a market and being a deal creator. And I'll speak to, I read this book about the Blackstone group, the CEO of Blackstone. They, you know, they bought this readout for $36 billion or something. And everybody's like, you're overpaying, you're overpaying. But nobody knew that in the background, they actually were selling 20 billion of the assets or whatever and, and off. And they actually basically did a double close. They, you know, within, and you had all these, they bought 36 billion, sold like 20 or something billion on like a double close on the very, you know, very same week. And they increased their equity from 4 billion to 8 billion just for knowing how to place deals and make opportunity. Um, and I think everybody looks and myself included is I look at price and say that price is more than it was last year. So it's not a deal anymore, but you're not, you got to really dive in and find out where the opportunity is because price is all relevant based on your creativity, correct? Yeah. So I, I had my whole company in escrow with Blackstone. Okay. And uh, two, a little over two years ago. And, and so I went through this whole process and uh, we were in an NDA and they had all our stuff in a war room and we were going to exit for, you know, in the billions. And, and um, you know, my friend said, you know, I just want you to know one thing. I said, what's that? He goes, just remember that you are not the smartest person at the table. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm like, okay, so what am I not seeing that they're seeing? And uh, it ended up being that they were looking at our whole portfolio as a massive value added sell off too, mm -hmm. you know, to, to mitigate, you know, and, and grow their numbers. So in other words, uh, it was it was what I wasn't seeing. And so, you know, those are really, really smart guys. And, and they make really, really good moves. But it's the same thing on a local small level. You, you, you know, it's, and they rely on guys like you, Cole. They do, you know, because you're, they're not gonna go into Cleveland and figure out a market and drive around. They're gonna, they're gonna look for a guy like you that's already done it as an example. And, and so, you know, what I really like about real estate is that it exists for the people, not the other way around. So if, you know, if there's an area where there's some logistics issues around warehousing and let's say um, cold storage or just regular industrial storage or even high office buildings based on whatever, uh, you know, or uh, highly occupied office buildings, you know, that that's something that you should be looking at. How do I solve that problem for that particular submarket? You know, I've seen this over and over and over and over and over. I, I was up north in um, northern uh, uh Ed, uh, near past Edmonton uh, in Canada, you know, obviously pre-COVID, but uh, and and there 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 there's all the stuff going on with the oil, um, uh, you know, the, the tar, the Bakken oil yeah. field. Is it the Bakken up there? No, that's the oil the sands. Up. They're the oil the sands. Oil, yeah, it's the yeah. And so anyway, there's billions of dollars being poured in up there. So I was it blew my mind because you know. So what do you need? You need massive housing, massive retail. And the office buildings were all full and the rents were climbing like this. And uh, of course, all it takes is one little pop in the oil pricing, you know, for all that to come back down. But that's what I'm talking about with, you know, that was very off the radar for a lot of people. People were not looking in Edmonton at office space. 
mm -hmm. as an example, but it was on fire and uh, Vancouver was not, you know? Yeah. And, and so, so you just got to, it's all very market driven, all this stuff. And that's why I love it because even with all the stuff going on, there's so much happening and, and you got to, I think, stay big picture and take a look at where are people going and why? And if you just keep asking that question, you know, is Cleveland Clinic, as an example, going to be here in 10 years? And if so, how big are they going to be? Or how about Ohio State? Maybe not, right? Yeah, I'd so, be worried you know, about the, yeah, colleges. Right. So, so those are things that are pretty common sense, if, if you think about it. Backtracking a little bit, talking like you, I know you're just talking about seeing big picture. When you were getting started and starting to build your companies, what took you from like, like one thing I struggle with is a mindset of, okay, I'm going to wholesale and flip X amount of homes a year or two. I'm going to build a billion dollar portfolio. Like what are the, what, op what opened you up to think that's possible and actually be able to put that, those steps in place? Cause so many people uh, get overwhelmed with, you know, one, two, three, four, five deals a year, being able to see, I don't know, a 250 person company with development, self-storage, multifamily, um, took you from being that young kid in Seattle who was managing a property to being able to now, now you manage all that and still live a, but it seems like a pretty fun lifestyle. So, um, and you're still uh, young. You're not an old guy. You're still young. <laughs> you know, I think you're what about 35 Ken. I still feel young, man. I tell you what. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, so great question. So here's the thing. I, I think people get too caught up in, you got to have goals. Don't get me wrong. So I have one year, three year, five year, 10 year goals for my company. And they're very clear. And, and so I have a one year goal, a three year goal, a five year goal, and a 10 year goal. Now that changes over time, but it's not like, you know, and so it's all measured by quarter. So we measure everything by quarter. And so what are we doing this quarter? Are we going to hit our one year goal? And I try to hit singles. That's it. I never try to hit home runs, just hit singles and singles and singles. And what happens, Cole, is that you every once in a while, you get a double and then you hit a triple. And then maybe once a year or once every couple of years, you hit a home run, you know, and 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 uh, you don't let it get to your head. You're like, OK, it's not how smart I was. You just, you, you know, and, and the meanwhile, you're you, you've grown just hitting singles. And, and so. The, the big aha I had was I was doing deals like you and when I was, uh, when I was younger. But at the end of the day, when I got to my early 30s, I didn't own any real estate. I just had made a bunch of money. Yep. And, and so I had made a bunch of cash. I paid a bunch of tax and I had nice stuff and I you know, was doing all this cool stuff. But at the end of the day, I didn't have any cash flow coming in. And so... That's when I switched from a, you know, I would call it a cash flow model, or I'm sorry, a capital gain model to a cash flow model, which is, you know, okay, so how do I, you know, how do I generate enough revenue so that I don't have to do deals? And, um, you know, how do I have enough reoccurring revenue so I can have the staff that's covered by my management company? And, and, um, and that's actually why I have the management company. So we got, you know, several hundred thousand a month coming in on just management fees and it pays all our overhead. And, um, and then, you know, and then we drop deals in based on the opportunity of the market at the time. So I, and so I don't feel any pressure to do a deal tomorrow, next month, even this year, because, you know, we're, we have, basically I write a check to myself, you know, I'm the general partner. We write a check to our management company to pay for all the overhead. Mm -hmm. And so then I can contract and expand that. Uh, and so, so I went from very transactional to um, intentional with having that reoccurring revenue come in each and every month. And, and that took, takes a significant amount of pressure off of anyone. And that's actually what the problem people have right now during this pandemic is all of a sudden, you know, that faucet stopped of cash, whether it was their paycheck Mm -hmm. or, you know, um, commission based or something, you know, their sales are off or whatever. So all these folks that, you know, were kind of on this, this train, that's actually the, 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 the basis behind rich dad, poor dad. Uh, if you think about it is, 
is is you know is developing this long term cash flow reoccurring revenue model so that you can make really smart strategic decisions and then at that point the truth was cool i didn't know what the hell i was doing when i when i hired a coo i mean i was like how do you hire a coo how do you hire a ceo how do you hire a cfo what do you even ask them you know i didn't know any of that and you you know the truth is, is you just figure it out just like you do you know, and I, I just knew that things were getting out of control in my accounting and I needed somebody smart, you know, really smart. And, and I made a couple of mistakes and I got a really good one. And so, you know, it's it's a uh, and then the peer to peer groups, you know, the EO entrepreneurs organization, the YPO, some of those peer to peer groups are money because these are you want to mentor. And I've had a ton of mentors and a kind of ton of coaches, none of which I've ever paid for. And, and, you know, just, I always made a habit of, you know, trying to uh, ask really good questions from people that are 20, 30 years older than me, as I was kind of moving along on everything, even how to raise my kids, you know, things that, you know, you just don't know how to do. Yeah. Unfortunately, Elliot makes me pay him, but all my other mentors go. <laughs> <Whatever>. <laughs> you know, speaking, you know, I want to unpack a little bit. I, if anybody here, you know, really listen and go back and listen to that. Because I think that's so wise. You know, I always had a hard time when we were making, I was, we're flipping a ton of properties, 20, 25 a year, making three, $400,000, you know, but then I didn't want to keep it as a rental. Cause I'm like, I can make 50 grand or I can make $300 a month. And it's just like, yeah, even after taxes. So, but then this year, my wife and I set a goal that we want to, you know, add $2,500 a month in cash flow, And we went gangbusters. We bought a 24 unit with three partners, two duplexes on our own, a single family. And I'm tied up in a million dollar eight unit right now. And as soon as this eight unit closed, we're out of the rat race because our expenses are really low. We're, we're done. I mean, so the pressure and then we started the call center, which is going to keep kicking cash flow in there. Um, but it's a hard mind shift to have, especially as a young kid. You want to make, you know, they, you were driven by a consumer world, right? Flashy yeah. cars, you know, big houses, big watches, all these things. Spend money, spend money, spend money. But long term, you're, you're, your yourself in 10 years is going to thank you if you actually go slow and grow well slowly. Yeah. You, you, I agree with you. You're constantly, you know, it's, it's ego. Yeah. It's all yeah. ego. It's, <laughs> it's, it's putting your, by the way, you know, I, I, I just bought a new Ferrari on Friday. I, I, I understand there's nothing wrong with having that stuff, No. but here, but here's the difference. I invest in a property. So I'll, I'll put two, 300,000 into a property that produces the cash flow to cover to buy the Ferrari. Mm -hmm. If I don't buy the Ferrari, you know, I it's super intentional, you know. So I'm I'm investing for cash flow to pay for the Ferrari. I'm not just taking that two or three hundred grand or four hundred grand to pay for the Ferrari. It's very I would rather put that and, and I would rather make you know forty, fifty thousand dollars in cash flow uh, a year on that money. Um, and have that pay for the car. And so most people just take their cash and pay for something. I take my cash and invest it in an asset that produces cash flow to pay for it. It's very different. Yeah, because you're using, if you're going out and buying that for three or $400,000, you're using after-tax income for a depreciating asset. If you're, you're buying an asset that pays for your, at, for your car, your depreciating asset or whatever, one, the cash never goes away. It's still in the freaking building, right? As long as the world doesn't fall off a cliff. But that's paying. I mean, we, we were doing the same thing this year with a Tesla. Um, and then uh, we bought some properties, but then the world went to shit. So I'm like, let's hold our cash because we're a little bit. We need to use our cash a little bit more wisely, I you know, at this point. Yeah. Game. Yeah. Yeah. So so I think as long as you, it's just a, it's a mindset, you, you know, if, if you it's not taught in school. So so but if you invest for cash flow and it's hard to do like. The, the, real, the real reason I went into, um, that I even considered uh, Blackstone, it was a big, big uh, decision internally. Obviously, Ross and I would have walked away with, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. And, um, and, and, but then, you know what? Then what? Okay, you stick it in the bank, you give it to a wealth manager, you know, you go out and do a bunch of fun stuff. But then, like, it's not invested. Yeah, I'm not getting the tax benefits. I'm not getting the cash flow. So it's almost like retirement, you know, like there's this big push. Everybody's like, okay, man, I'm pushing for this retirement. And, and uh, my brother just went through this. He still lives in Seattle. He just retired. So they've got all this cash or whatever, you know, they've saved or whatever. It's all these different things, you know, but 
yeah, that's it, man. Like, you know, like he's, yeah. he's got to manage it, you know, yeah, and hopefully right. he doesn't get sick. So, so, you, you know, it's so, I, I don't want to be in that position. I want to have cash flow that's coming in all the time. And if I want to go, you know, I want to go to Europe for two months, then I do because I've got so much cash coming in that it's paid for, you know? And, and so everything I'm doing is paid for the minute I, as my buddy said, the minute you sell that golden goose, which is what he called it, uh, which was our company that's producing all this cash because everyone works their asses off to get this golden goose. You've done it. And now you're going to pat, you're going to sell it to Blackstone. And, and, um, and he, it was a good point. You know, I would have been sitting here managing my wealth manager, you know, trying to figure out what to do next, trying to buy a company. And I've watched guys do this, you know, they throw a hundred grand here, a million here or whatever. And, um, it's frustrating for them because one, they're not in control Two, they're, you know, making a hope or a gamble that this new, new person or this new tech or this new technology or this new, whatever is going to do well. And, and you're better off to, you know, just create this massive, uh, reoccurring revenue cash flow model and, and then take that cash and, and then do those kinds of things. Gotcha. Yeah. You, you, one thing, I got a couple questions. Um, so first you were doing a talk with Kiyosaki a couple months ago and he was talking about death and taxes. Um, or debt and taxes, I'm sorry, debt and taxes. And so he would say, he was saying he would give you a million dollars and then in five years you give him back a million dollars, but then he would still have cash flow off that, you know? So Cole and I started a uh, company with Tucker, uh, and it's going to be a very high cash flow, but it's ordinary income. How, mm. how did, how did can you break that down of like, obviously how, how, what he was meaning on that with the million dollars in and all that stuff. Cause it's not a 1031 cause it's, you know, it's in, earned income. So how do you, how, how would you protect yourself if you are a high income earner at this point? And you, you know, there's a lot of guys that are high income earners that also are real estate professionals. So they can't maybe write off some of their, their real estate that they do own. And what's your thoughts on that? So it's a really good, really good question. I'm not a tax guy, but I will tell you um, what, what we do is the, the tax laws are really clear. In other words, there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff in the tax code and um, you know, uh, hopefully you never have to read this, but the, there's a very, very small piece that says, these are all the things that you can do and are, are incentives. Mm -hmm. And so as long as you know what the incentives are, the government basically tells you what they want. So uh, you guys are probably too young, but I don't know if there was a time where it was alternative fuel vehicles okay. and all this money went into that. There's a time when it was solar and all this money yeah. went into that. There's a time when it's oil and gas and all this money went into that. And so the government basically tells you what they want and through tax incentives and that money gets attracted to those things based on what the government basically passes these tax codes. So people with cash are looking for ways to save tax mm -hmm. all the time. So whether that's capital gains or whatever it is, you know, and that's all going to change through this administration based on, you know, who's next. Mm -hmm. So, um, so one, you just got to just follow the tax code, be very clear on what that is. And you can do very well by doing that, by mitigating your tax. So Robert, as an example, the, at one point they had a, uh, I, I want to say it was 80%. I might be wrong, but he got an 80% write off in the first year for investing into oil and gas, as an example. Okay. So he puts a million bucks in, he gets an $800,000 write-off against other stuff. And so a lot of the guys that, uh, you know, that, that, that I'm rolling with, they're always looking for ways to mitigate tax. So they got cash coming out, but they're figuring it out. Real estate is a great way for that because the, what Robert was talking about specifically is um, and what he left out was that he invested in one of our uh, multiple deals actually uh, that was a value add. So so let, let's say we buy a twenty million dollar deal and we need five million bucks and okay. he gives me a he gives me a million and I put a million in and we, you know we raise the other three. Is that million though? Is that after tax dollars or is that pre tax dollars? It's what it's where whatever he does. I don't care where he oh, does. Okay, gives me the money. Yeah. So those okay. are. Those are things that Robert, you know, they could be that with him, but we don't even care. Okay. You know, we, we just need 5 million bucks to close this deal. So we get, we, we put 5 million down, we get a $5 million, a $15 million debt, let's say. 
Well, before I buy that property, that $20 million property, I already know that if I clean the place up, you know, put some money in it and, and grow the rents, I'm going to grow that thing to 26, 27, $28 million, you know, based on the net operating income, because the properties are all valued based on net operating income. Mm -hmm. So he's looking at that. So he gives me a million bucks and we spend three, four, five years in growing this value. Then we go back to the bank. And now, now the things, let's say we're 28 or 27 and uh, we get a $20 million loan. Well, so I pay off the debt of 15 and I give all my equity back of the five. So now what's happened is that's a, basically a cash out refi. Yep. So you pay no that's taxes. That's all that is. No ta it's yeah. getting, yeah, it's 20 million bucks yep. against the new value. Mm -hmm. We clean up all the old stuff. We pay off the old debt. We pay off all the equity. And that's tax free for Robert because it's a cash out refi mm -hmm. and you don't pay tax on debt. And he's basically just getting his money back. Yep. So it's not a return at that point. He gave me a million. I gave him back. Okay. So it's not, he has no capital gains. He basically gets his million bucks back, but he's still in the deal. He's still in the $28 million deal. And he's still at the same percentage of ownership and that thing's kicking off cash. So, so now he has an infinite return. He's given me a million bucks. I've given it back to him. And now he's got this reoccurring revenue. And guess what all of the investors do? And this is the beauty of, of that's why if you can figure this out, Cole, it, obviously when I give that 5 million bucks back to the investors in three or four years, let's say, yeah, uh, if we can achieve that, uh, they turn right back and say, I want to do that again, of course, mm -hmm. right? Because they've gotten all their money back tax-free. And so that's what that means. And that's using debt. So it's using debt to buy it and then using debt to get it back but you have to have a value add asset in order to do that. Yeah, and I think, I think a big thing for people watching this is they hear numbers like 15 million, 5 million, 20 million. And the average person, you know, a lot, most people aren't doing deals at that scale, um, but it's just as, I think it's important to make it clear, it's just as possible to do all this stuff with small. I'll give you, I'll give you another example. Oh, okay, you'll love this one, actually. I'm in the billboard business too. So oh, we, yeah, you told me about I start, that. I started buying billboards and I'll, I'll do this really quickly. So, you know, I get a ton of deals across my desk, just like you guys probably do. And one of them came across as just a few acres in Mesa of all places. And uh, it had a, um, it was 300,000 for this land or 290 or something. And it had a billboard right in the middle of it. And the billboard was making less than 5,000 a year, year over year. Okay. So er this thing went out to thousands of people, obviously. So I call up my billboard guy and I say, hey, this looks, this is on a major road. Is, is it possible for me to, um, you, you know, to um, uh, monetize this better than it has been? He's like, absolutely. This is like 50,000 cars a day. And uh, we think that we can do somewhere, you know, right around 4,000 a month, two, two grand per side. So it's called the static billboard. Um, and he's like anywhere from 1,500 to 3,000 a month, you know, with car dealers and casinos and all these, you know, circle K's and all these kinds of people that will stick their billboards up because neighbors, neighborhoods hate billboards. Yeah. They don't, they, you know, they just don't want them. So I go, okay. So I put the thing in escrow and then I do a little more research to make sure that can work. I put an easement around the billboard. I relisted the land for 300 grand and sold it. So now I got the billboard uh, and I've got, I own the easement. And um, so now I got zero in the deal at 300 grand and uh, the billboards making me four grand a month, uh, right around three to 4,000 a month. So there you go. There's a, For a billboard. Deal. Yeah. So the, the point call is, is that this stuff's everywhere. Yeah. You know, it's, it's what you see, you, you know? And so I understand that's a great point of talking about it in the millions. And uh, that's the space I'm in at the moment. But the point is, is I just did that deal a year and a half ago. So, you know, those kinds of things are everywhere, man. I'm telling you, you could do that with a house. You could do that with a vacant building. You find a vacant building, hundred grand, 200 grand, you find a tenant. It's worth more, man. Period. That's yeah. just the way it is. I love yeah. that. That's hilarious. Yeah. yeah. Um, so one, one, I want to tie it in because there's a lot of uncertainty in, uh, with the market. And so the Fed, I was just looking at the money supply, you know, from 2019 to, to 2000 or 2020, 
you know, the feds went from 15 trillion to 18.6 trillion. Uh, you know, the mortgage backed securities, the reason mortgages seem like they're on, you know, stabilizes they're at 2.03 trillion dollars opposed to half a billion last year if they bought, so they bought a billion and a half in mortgage backed securities. Do you think inflation is a real thing? And so are you thinking, I want to get more of 2020 dollars in a deals um, opposed to, so I, you know, cause their value is, you know, different, you know, cause I'm at, it's going to be worth more in 2020. My dollar is the next year. I know this is a massively confusing subject to me. I'm not going to lie. Hey, are you good I, to keep going a little bit yeah, longer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got about uh, maybe 10 more minutes. Perfect. Okay. So, you know, I vacillate between deflation and inflation. I'm I'm studying both. Um, I I would, you know, I could pick a lane and go down that lane with you. But the truth is, um, I just don't know, man. I, 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 my gut feels like, with the amount of money that, you know, it, it, you know, I went through the 08 stuff and that, that the money that um, uh, came out at that time, the, uh, I think it was called uh, TARF, TARP, TARP yeah. Trouble uh, that, that went to the banks and then a lot of the banks paid those back. So it never actually made it, you know, to the people a lot, you know, some, you know, the banks did uh, prop themselves up and do loans and things like that. So uh, not all of it, but um, there's a, there's one mindset that's saying because all the money came out in stimulus and it's coming out in unemployment, it's coming out in PPP and EIDL and all that stuff, it's actually in circulation, then we're going to see inflation. So um, the, the, the key to inflation, uh, if there is a key, is that the money has to circulate. That's it. I mean, if the money isn't circulating, and I think right now people are saving a lot. If you look at savings rates, they're at all time highs. And they should be. I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty. So um, if I was to pick a lane, I would say it would probably be more inflationary. But I think that, you know, we're definitely going to see, obviously, massive deflation in, like, commercial office yes, buildings. In, in San, San Francisco, Francisco condo market. Yeah, right, <laughs> right, you know, yeah. they're so, flooded. Yeah. So you can't, I don't think you can blanket it over the whole country. But it feels like that, you know, we've injected so much money into the economy that, that, um, you know, that that could be uh, we could be devaluing the currency because of that. Yeah. yeah. Also on a, an inflationary level, though, if you look at lumber prices, I know they're coming back down to earth a little bit more. My thought and tell me if you look at this when you're looking at a building either to buy or build your thought. OK, could I rebuild this building for the same price I'm buying it for with rehab? And it's really nice. Are you looking at that versus, you know, on buildings versus buying versus um, on that inflationary level? So the, we do that every time. So whenever, whenever existing product becomes higher than something we can build, that's actually when we switch over to building. So, you know, we, we've had a, a construction company for a long time and a development company for a long time. And so when the market gets really pumped on the, you know, in other words, when you're trying to buy something for two, three, 400,000 a door and you can build it for 200, then it makes more sense to build. And, and so we've always done that. And there's a number of components in there. You know, uh, lumber specifically is it's kind of a short term issue because of, uh, believe it or not, because of COVID and uh, Canada being shut down. And, uh, you know, we get a lot of timber from Canada and also the wildfires. So all of that stuff has, you know, has, has kind of temporarily spiked lumber. Uh, at the moment, but I, you know, it, it's happened before with Chinese, uh, you know, drywall and steel and, you know, all that kind of stuff um, happens from time to time, um, you know, as, as, it, as it can. Um, perfect. What I was just texting Cole, typing Cole, but do you think the election that's coming up next week is going to have, like, are you thinking that we're going to go one way or another? I, I feel like maybe Biden's more of the same old, uh, Obama, you know, he's an old guard. He's not, he's going to be, he's still be holding a bunch of the banks and it's not a lot that's going to change. Trump's a little bit more wild. I mean, Cole, do you have anything to? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a great question. I think it's important. I mean, um, not only on like a real estate side, but across like we're talking about inflation, um, taxes, the whole deal, it's going to go into people's strategies of investing for the next, you know, four to eight years. It's not just, it's, you know, it's everything. Um, so yeah, I guess exactly that. What do you think is you think that's going to change a bunch or? Like yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It depends on who's elected. But, you know, 
Uh, if Trump stays, obviously, uh, I think the opportunity zones and the capital gains and all that kind of stuff will stay in place. Um, you know, and and there's some uh, some some you know some real stuff around this estate tax, and, and you know, and being able to transfer uh, you know money to an you know your state. I think all of that stuff is on the table moving forward with if Biden wins, you know, potentially. I mean, it, it, it um, you know, but the, the truth is guys like, you know, it, it, it's important, but you just adjust, yeah. you know, things you just adjust if, 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 you know, the capital gains tax, you know, gets reduced to, you know, it just, what it does, money flows, you know, again, back to this tax thing, you know, it's a, you know, the money will flow you know, maybe it's a uh, Biden wins, you know, to this green energy plan, you know, whatever that is. Uh, and, you know, it'll be that. And there's real estate components around that for sure. Yeah. So, you know, it'll 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 just go the way it goes. And, and, and uh, most of it's around these tax policies. And then obviously um, a little bit more social. Uh, and, and that is only going to help renters. Yeah. yeah and so you know, like, like if, if, if Biden gives a bunch of money to people to pay rent, that I mean, that helps, you know, me. So, it, mm -hmm. you know, and if, if, if he takes away the cap gain thing, well, you know, maybe it's a net net. I don't know. You, you, you know, so we're not really wrapped up in that too much. Uh, you know, every single president comes out with something a little bit different uh, geared toward what, you know, if, if you think about it back when Bush was in office, he was a big home ownership guy yeah. and it ran, it ran. Um, I mean, it, you know, I don't, you know, Cole, what, what actually happened prior to 2008 was he was pro home ownership. Well, that hurts renters. Yeah. So, you know, all these people were getting these low loans and, and, and buying investor properties and all that kind of stuff. And, in, in let's call it early two thousands. Well, all that stuff popped. And, 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 you know, so that was one policy one president had, and he was trying to get every, he really believed that everybody should be in a home and, and that got out of hand. And, you know, we, they started, you know, doing these no qual loans and, you know, people could fog a mirror and get a loan, you know, and, and all of a sudden, you know, pop. So, you know, it just depends on, you know, what happens, but I, I guys, I'm telling you, like, doesn't matter. Like it, it, if who's in office, stuff's going to happen, stuff's going to get passed and you just got to pivot. And uh, kind of wrapping it up here, I know I wanted to ask this question the whole interview, but uh, I thought it'd be good at the ending. I know you have uh, boys around my age. What are, what are you telling them as they grow up in the current economy and um, our, where our country's at? What, what are you telling them to build? Uh, you know, so for... from the time they were young, it's always been side hustle, yep. just like you two, always. So, I mean, literally from the time they're eight or 10 years old, you know, they were figuring out, I, I taught them, um, you know, um, you know, how to start businesses, how to barter, you know, how to figure out how to pay for things themselves and not ask me. And, and so, yeah, I, my, uh, they're both entrepreneurs. My son is just finishing up entrepreneur school right now at University of Arizona. And um, he's super pumped about, you know, he's already, he's had a zillion little companies, you know, from fixing iPhones to t-shirts to, um, you know, selling beats online and, you know, all these little things and, and they've always been self-sufficient. So, and I, I think that you know, this is a great example of why you should be is, is, uh, you know, and, he, and he's had kids probably like you did in high school saying, how do you have money all the time? And, and I never give them money. And, yeah. you know, I was always like, Hey, let's figure out, you know, if you want something, I mean, these are goofy little examples, but my, I remember when my son was 12, he wanted a knife. Right. And so I had to convince my wife, but I'm like, Oh yeah, should we get Kate a knife? And she's like, hell no. And I'm like, well, let's figure out how I said, okay, how can you do it? So, you know, he said, okay, well, I want one of these. So he bought four and sold the other three to cover the fourth. It's <laughs> the same, it's the same concept, right? So he, I, I can't remember exactly what they were. They were 20 or $30 each, but he marked them up, had the other three sold before he even bought it. So he came back to his mom and said, listen, this is how I can get a free knife. I got the other three sold to these, my three buddies. That's it. Yep. So that's how you look at real estate, you know? And so that's what I've been grinding into my kids the entire time. Uh, they're uh, the side hustle is important guys. You got, in my opinion, especially now, people should believe this. 
you got to have multiple streams of income coming in from different ways at all times. And, and, um, you know, and, and some are going well and some are not. And, yeah. and, um, you just always have to have, uh, that, that kind of safety net. Yeah. I love that just because, I mean, I know I have family, friends, people I know that were our doctors and work at hospitals that are getting laid off right now. And they thought they had the most secure jobs ever. So I think having side hustles and being able to create your own income, you're, that's the only really security you can, you can have right now. And then I, yeah, I, I, I don't, I, you should have that stuff. I mean, be a doctor if you want to be a doctor, but no, no, I know, no. I know, like you said, I, I know a zillion doctors. My buddy just came out with a book actually hit the market today on why doctors are broke and he's a doctor. You know, and he had all this, he had all this real estate side hustle. His name's Tom Burns. You guys uh, you should Google the book. It literally, I did the forward for it about two or three months ago. And, um, you know, I agree with you, Cole. I mean, my brother was the same way. Luckily he missed all this, but he just, you know, went to work every day, worked his ass off, grew, you know, threw money at, you know, didn't even really know what he was investing in because it was all taken out of his checks along the way. And, um, you know, it's a very different mindset to turn your money over to some wealth manager and then, you know, hope that it's um, grown. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there might be a great opportunity in strip clubs here coming up after COVID. I'll let you guys handle that one. <laughs> All right, Ken, man, I appreciate it. How can we support you? I know you got an uh, Instagram page. You're putting a ton of, you really started ramping up the con content this year. How can our listeners support you? What can we do to help you? I know you came out with a new book this year. Um, what can we do for you? Yeah. Um, just Thank you. Yeah. So uh, KenMacroy.com, you know, is where you can find everything. So you can go there for the YouTube. We're growing like crazy on YouTube. You've got a bunch of free stuff there. We do the podcast like you guys, uh, the forms. Uh, there's, there's a whole bunch of videos there um, and just a tremendous amount of content on how to get started and asking you know, all the right questions and all that. It's all free. So uh, just go there. You can find the books. You can find everything there. And uh, really appreciate being on today, guys. Yeah, thank awesome. you. Awesome. We'll shut this off. Uh, thanks, guys. And uh, we'll see you next week. Yeah.